Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Jim Moore, how's it going? It's great. How are you doing, Matt? Good, good. This is our uh, third round of the Apollo case study series. And, uh, you know, I just want to take a minute before we get into our topic here to, to, to just let you know that I have been getting... Uh, a fair amount of feedback on the first two ones, especially the last one of functional assessment that seemed to be something that really resonated with the audience. So I just wanted to give you a quick shout out for that. I went to the ABAI conference in Boston recently, and uh, a lot of people in quite unprompted came up to me to tell me how much they uh, like this, uh, this concept of what we're doing and that, and again, that episode in particular, they, they really enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, so I just uh, again want to share that. I was just curious to see what uh, feedback you might be getting on, on your end with regard to this kind of uh, experiment we're conducting here, this uh, media experiment. Uh, there's been a few people who've emailed me, uh, lots of just asking more questions. Just I've had I've had quite a bit of folks just expressing appreciation uh, that we're even doing this, and and it really. Um, is very uh, um, encouraging to me because when we get into some of the maybe softer topics like supervision and stuff like that, um, I think it, it, it will be really beneficial to folks. So that's been real awesome. Not, I haven't really heard um, really any negative feedback at all, which is, is really nice. I would like if, if folks have, constructive criticism or things that we would like, they would like for us to maybe dive into a little bit deeper. Uh, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. Or maybe do like a mailbag uh, yeah. uh, session. That would be really fun. I, uh, you know, I love you know, I did that with parent, uh, with a parent group at the beginning of the year, they asked me to do um, a 90 minute talk. And they specifically said, we want you to hold 45 minutes to the end to answer any and all parent questions. And I was always told by former mentors that I should avoid that type of venue, but I found it ex- extraordinarily um, enjoyable. And just to really hear parents come, um, you know, with, with their real concerns and just say, hey, like one parent was like, hey, could you possibly, I know reinforcement's a real easy concept for behavior analysts, but I've been, my kid's been in ABA six years and I still don't quite get it. And I'm like, wow. How does that happen? And you'd never <laughs> know unless you unless you provided space for that to occur. That's right. Yeah, that's that that's good. It's uh, yeah, you know, that's definitely uh the 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 upside reward to those sorts of things are are, are fairly unlimited, I'd imagine, especially in, with a parent uh, group. Uh, and you get those kind of real world stuff that you'd we'd all just assume that because we're uh, further along the, the timeline, if you will, in terms of being saturated and living this life. So yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great example. So, uh, it, so in today's, uh, uh, I guess installment of the Apollo case study series, I want to talk a little bit about the approach that you guys are using as it relates to language de- uh, development. Uh, and uh, I, w- one of the, things that I think will be interesting, at least from a selfish perspective, is I don't do a lot of language development work myself, uh, you know, and so it's an opportunity for me to kind of hear what's, what's going on out there uh, in, um, in, in this, this line of work. So uh, I guess bef- as a way to get started, I, I think in that light, Jim, uh, I'd like to get kind of like a holistic sense of, uh, you know, how you guys are approaching language and skill development at Apollo. Um, and and perhaps upstream of that, you know, what I know you've referenced your uh, your your barnstorming tour of clinics across the country, uh, <laughs> and so maybe as a way of introduction to this topic, you know, maybe so you've got this kind of perspective. I think that's unique because you've 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 seen a lot of different applications of of behavior analysis. I'd like to start with getting your sense of kind of like w- w- what's going right and, and where are people experiencing challenges? And then we can perhaps narrow the focus down to like, how does that inform your work at Apollo and the type of stuff that you guys are doing there specifically? 
Sure, absolutely. I think this is really exciting because, you know, we're setting the stage to bring uh, hopefully more than one, but definitely at least one of our behavior analysts into our next episode to talk about this concept, but as it's practically applied and, and learning it as a BCBA that didn't have a background in our approach. But uh, I, it would be, um, I, I have to make mention that somehow in my career, I found myself in the middle of the two big hot topic points of contention. Last episode, it was functional assessment. And it's really sad. Let me just say how sad I find it that there's so much vitriol in, in these areas and so much disagreement instead of, you know, pure pursuit of, you know, skeptical truth or, or pragmatic truth, whatever we can find. And then the second being language development. So I think it would be helpful to first talk about how I got into this. Sure. And it was quite by accident, you know, in fact, people who know me and know my background and who my mentors were, find they say, wait, you're a guy that's doing practical applications of relational frame theory. How in the world did you hit your head? Did you, you know, did, did, did something happen? And, and no, I, when I left the market, what was then the Marcus Institute, now the Marcus Autism Center, I went to work for uh, the May Institute. We were building school-based consultation programs here in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Now, up to this point, my experience had been almost predominantly individuals with severe intellectual disabilities. Very few of them had vocal speech. And so I get into the schools, which I'd had some experience with because my PhD is in school psychology. I really didn't, you know, by this point, I had learned much more, much more experience and so I get called into a uh, school district outside the metro Atlanta area to conduct a functional assessment. And they specifically asked for functional analysis with a child in an emotionally behaviorally behavior disorder classroom. And so his vocal sophistication was way off the charts compared to what I was accustomed to. And so I went in and by this time we were already doing kind of like we talked about last episodes, we were not strictly following always an Awadian isolated contingency analysis. We would use descriptive data to tailor the analysis and sometimes have uh, multiple contingencies, sort of our like escape to attention paper that Mike, uh, Mike Mueller, Heather Sterling, and I published in a school psychology journal. But I go in and I have this kid who is extraordinarily vocal. And I noticed that that analysis didn't work very well. Number one, I, I, I determined early on that he was tacting the contingencies to himself of every condition, making all of them irrelevant. He was basically, oh, this is the one where if I hit him, I get to have a little break or I get to go over here and do these things. And so our, when you graph the data, if you showed it to most behavior analysts who work in settings like Kennedy Krieger or Marcus, they said, oh, it's automatic reinforcement. Being there in person, you knew that was not the case. Um, and I just started to notice that, you know, shortly after that, I returned to Mississippi. I was working at a college and doing some private practice. And I kind of went back to my one of my joys, which was naturalistic environmental training to specifically produce vocal mans and, you know, get the little bitty ones. They're so much fun. You get their first words. It's just a huge celebration for the family and, and all sorts of things like this. Well, as I continued working with these clients, I started to notice that we were see, seeing some problem behaviors that they did not have earlier in their history. And to the best of my knowledge at that time, I really couldn't find a clean function for these behaviors as I'd been trained to. It seems so when I started talking to them, because my graduate mentor uh, was a big advocate for whenever possible, you know, don't even maybe think about it as an interview, but just talk to the kid and just see. And then, you know, hopefully you'll get some truthful answers. And so I started asking kids, like, when you go to the store and mom goes down the bread aisle first, why do you lose your mind? 
you know, or something a little bit more appropriately worded than that. And I would get things like, you have to go down the meat aisle first because, well, it actually was the opposite. No, it was like, you have to go down the meat aisle first because if you put your bread in the basket first, it will get smashed and you'll have smashed bread to eat all week. So they were, I, I determined that, wow, they seem to be generating rules. Some of them are very concrete and their adherence to that rule is rigid. And it started looking to me like, wow, I talked to the parents. These parents seem to be trying their best to comply with their child's rules because we know parents are motivated to avoid meltdowns. But when they would go into settings where it was difficult to, to follow their very unrealistic rule, they would kind of tantrum for, you know, and be almost inconsolable. And to watch it, to kind of step back and really just observe that behavior, it looked more like extinction-induced behavior than something specifically related to, I've learned I get attention or I get a candy bar at the store or whatever it was. And so I've, I found myself really disillusioned that this technology that I'd put you know, so much faith into and so much work didn't seem to hold as true and, and as cleanly as some of my very awesome experiences earlier in my career. And that led me into a journey to try and figure out, you know, at that time, and you might remember it, Matt, when you were in graduate school, did you ever have this professor that would ask you, how many of these behavioral principles do you strictly apply to yourself about all of your behavior? You know, back in those days, we'd be like, yeah, that stuff works great for our clients. But, you know, with me, and I'm not talking about any of the attitudes yeah. like determinism or anything, but J Jim, John just certain hmm? Jim Johnston used to tell us, if you're not measuring your own behavior, you're not a true behavior analyst. <laughs> that sounds about like something he would say. <laughs> you know, so anyway. Um, I stumbled into, I, I went to ABAI, I don't remember the year, it's been a long time ago, and I stumbled into a talk. Uh, I was actually trying to go to a Brian Owada talk, but it was packed. So I just went into the room right next to it, and it was Dermot Barnes Holmes, and he was talking about relational frame theory, which was something I had never heard of, had never heard of in my life. And he put up this um the statement on the board on the, or on the overhead that said, if the light is green, dot, dot, dot. And then he said, everyone complete this sentence and the whole room and chorus went go. And he asked, he goes, how did you know to respond that way? He goes, instead of us talking about things like knowing and all these invisible things, let's actually analyze the structure of this statement and look at functional sources of control. And then he kind of unveiled uh, rule governed rule govern behavior and RFT with a simple little uh, example. Then he switched it to, he goes, now tell me the opposite of this. And of course, everyone said, when the light is red, stop. Like, Great. Then he goes, now just tell me something different than this. Everyone then said, when the light is yellow, and then you heard this pause. He goes, ah, you don't know how to answer that because all of us have a different history when it comes to the, the yellow light. There's motivating operations. There's different uh, contingencies at play that may mediate. You may behave one way in the presence of one yellow light and a different way in the presence of another yellow light. But it was the way he analyzed the, the structure, not, not, you know, old school diagramming sentences for grammar, but he looked at, you know, for example, the construction of, the light is green, light is green. That now puts green into a hierarchy of all of the stimulus content you have associated with lights. Given that history, you can discriminate that light green is talking about traffic lights. And he just kind of went in and did kind of a functional analysis of that whole sentence. And it really kind of blew me away because I'd never really thought about it that way. I just thought that Hey, you know, all of us think, but we don't talk about that because we're behavior analysts. And I'd read Skinner's Behaviors Within the Skin, uh, which was really more about the private events. I think he was talking about more was physiological events. But what about this conversation that you have with yourself? And that took me to find the Purple Book, the RFT book by Steve Hayes. And I started, I really was highly skeptical at first. I didn't like some of the way they phrase things. I did not 
I could see that they were not really trying to correct Skinner, but merely extend, but to call something post Skinnerian, you know, it's like some people, you know, have the candle with Skinner on it that they burn and pay tribute to every night. Oh, um, there's the cardboard cutout of him at the, uh, at all the uh, conferences, <laughs> right? You get yourself, your selfie right. with, you know, so. then, then you have the fact that they're calling this relational frames, like it's a thing. And I've heard Steve Hayes say so many times since then that it's not really a thing. It's just a term we used to talk about contextual stimulus control, generalized operant behavior. And really when I started looking at it and comparing it to some of the other explanations in our field for complex human behavior, I found that one to actually hold true to parsimony the best. And then when you look at their studies, Journal of Experimental Analysis of Behavior, JABA, we're not talking about really weak journals. We're talking about the top journals in our field. And I looked at those methodologies and I was just blown away, the elegance of those methodologies. But thankfully, I'd been trained by a very good scientist in graduate school that when you encounter something new, that does not necessarily mean you throw away everything else you've ever learned and just focus on this one big new thing. And so I started to to think kind of like physics, where when you drive over a bridge, even today, there are still some Newtonian physics that went into building that bridge. Thankfully, they've progressed. And it's not only that. I kind of started to see that there seemed to be some operant targets that we um, intervene with in in treatment that lend themselves to more of our strict Skinnerian verbal behavior method, whereas some don't. Now to throw out the big controversial statement, I will, I will say social skills training seems to be one of those where I think a lot of the criticism we get that I've heard of myself earlier in my career that, yeah, y'all, you're teaching all this social behavior. Why does my kid sound like a robot? Why does my kid not do this at home? And I come up here to your clinic and I see it because we weren't, we didn't understand that we were really contriving manned motivation rather than the sources of control, multiple sources of control over social behavior. And so I started looking at this issue with RFT um, as a possible methodology for some of these more difficult behaviors. The thing I couldn't get over when I first encountered RFT, though, because I was not well read enough, was the issue with once we got kids who seemed happy-go-lucky and free to a certain level of verbal sophistication, they seemed to become angry, anxious, and rigid. And it was, I found it time after time after time. And just by accident, I, I, was sitting down there and I'm very interested in why children don't pick up relations as we expect. So rather than all only being focused on methodology to get the S plus selected, I want to know why they're selecting what they're selecting. And so I was working with a kid and we were teaching different types of money relations. A kid picked up, you know, $10 bill is more than a $5 bill is more than a $1 bill. Pick that up. No problem. When we started teaching coin money, he really struggled and got extraordinarily angry because he could not accept that a nickel is less than a dime. He would literally hold them up to me and say, look there, this one is more. And I found that with a few other clients a couple of years later and start, I started saying, what's the deal here? And I found a real elegant discussion in, in various circles around non-arbitrary and arbitrary stimuli. And when I really started, I'd never really thought about that, about, you know, hey, some stimulus relations are non-arbitrary, meaning you can prove them in the physical world, like what's heavier, a kettlebell or a feather, well, let's just let the scale answer that for us. But if I gave you a picture of James Hetfield and Dave Mustaine and said, which one is heavy using that colloquialism as music? Well, we all, every time I do that, people giggle because it's like, who's right, who wrong. It's like, if we got into a discussion, you know, who's better, the Atlanta Falcons or the New Orleans Saints, I would try to bring non-arbitrary sources of proof. Like, well, Hey, we won the Super Bowl in 2009 and y'all have lost twice. 
And they would retort with, well, we've been twice, you've been once. And you go back and back. And what we're really getting into is this realm of arbitrary stimulus relations where they not, not aren't necessarily like, the name spoken word Winnie the Pooh is not physically the same as a picture of Winnie the Pooh. So, right? so, so just to, just to, uh, so, so you, are you saying that those, those relations can't be accounted for by uh, things like multiple exemplar training and bi-directional name oh, and all, you know? No, I think they can. I think ultimately when you stack them all up together, and you look across all of our operant targets, which is what I try to do. I try to use the one that is most clinically pragmatic and most parsimonious. So that's not to say that other theories don't discuss these topics at all. It was the first time I had really talked about it. And I'd been trained in stimulus equivalents. I never even had a discussion about, you know, some relations are arbitrary. They just go to the kind of from that level of selection that's cultural selection. Uh, and some stimulus relations are non-arbitrary. Um, it was it was simply for me and my journey, the first time I had encountered that. So I, I started noticing that, you know, like, have, have you ever asked yourself, when I go through and I put, I've put thousands of BCBAs through what I call relating games, just these matching the sample games I come up with, with the weirdest combinations of abstract stimuli I can think of. And that they'll get it and then they'll derive all these great things. And I said, now, okay, without any jargon, how did you do that? And I go, well, and then you'll get all sorts of strategies, you know, like, hey, I remember, you know, the, the top of this symbol looked like the top of this girl's hair and they, they go together. So I kept telling myself, look for the swoop. And that's how, you know, or they'll just say, well, I just talked to myself, say, remember, it was here last time and now it's here. Well, what that's talking about is speaker is listener behavior, mm -hmm. which I really think undergirds a lot of from whatever camp you're coming from, the ability to privately act as speaker and listener is critical to human behavior, in my opinion. And that was really the first time I'd ever seen that. And then when you would go in and talk to these kids with autism who had, whose expressive vocabulary had really grown, and you really started putting them through kind of language pragmatic exercises, you discover it's like, wow, they really can't do this stuff. Yeah, you know, there were a lot of really great talks about speakers, listener at the, the recent Verbal Behavior Conference. So yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of interesting work going on in that realm right now. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out. I also so want to point out for the... For the listener too, that I will include a Wikipedia entry for uh, James Hetfield and uh, Dave Mustaine. So that's uh, for for anyone not into uh, '80s and '90s heavy metal. Uh, we'll have an explainer in the show notes. But you, you really, I'm, I'm I'm serious, Matt. You should really. I wish you could have heard BCBAs defending their choice on that. I had one gentleman uh, that's our age, and he said. Not only is Dave Mustaine in a band called Megadeth, he was the original lead guitarist for Metallica. So he has more bona fides than James oh, yeah. Hetfield has. I'm like, it's, it's really amazing when you get into, like I put up, you know, no, um, not talking politics now, but I'll put, I, oh, I like please to sometimes, <laughs> I, I sometimes like to make people uh, uncomfortable. So I'll put up all of these, I'll put up all these comparisons. I'll say, which one is awesome and which one is awful. And I always do the funny one, which is which one is awesome. A picture of the saints helmet, a picture of the Falcons helmet, which one is awful picture of the saints helmet, picture of the Falcons helmet. Everyone will laugh. I said, but seriously, you could go to peach tree street in Atlanta and get people ready to fight people from Bourbon Street in New Orleans, Louisiana, over their disagreement on that question. So then I'll always pop one up and don't offer commentary. Which one is awesome? A picture of Donald Trump, a picture of Barack Obama. Which one is awful? A picture of Donald Trump and a picture of Barack Obama. And I'll just simply say, do you understand that people are willing to go to blows to prove themselves right in something that really, when you get down to it, is still somewhat arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And these types of things, and when you get into language, and, and especially in language like English, that is just filled with idiomatic phrases, 
when I, when you don't have that arbitrarily applicable relational responding repertoire, what do you do with that? And I started noticing that, wow, we, we have a real low ceiling with the way that I was trained. I, get, I can get a kid to a certain point and then it's like, okay, what do we keep doing? Maybe we just do social group or maybe we do this or we do that, but we weren't really getting them over that hump to where they could have a life that they fully direct, that they're fully independent to make their own decisions. And I made the decision that, hey, for at least some of these behaviors to develop, so a deficit in speakers, listener behavior, which I get is difficult to measure. But if we assume that that's true, what are we going to do to remediate that? And interestingly enough, you asked about multiple exemplar training. That's my go-to when a kid doesn't derive even basic symmetrical relations. We go right in and we start using multiple exemplars, it's like teaching them, hey, there's a rule here that you learned it this way and we just flipped it. So now once they learn that rule, we bring in all new stimuli and we, we make sure that's kind of what Dermot Barnes Holmes and Stephen Hayes, when they talk about how does deriving emerge in children, they'll often point out multiple exemplar training that parents use naturalistically as one of those sources. But then I just didn't go full tilt uh, into the RFT camp. I was working a clinical job and teaching at a university. My, my typical two full-time job life that I, I had had up until recently for a long time. And so I put my students in my lab to work to really start using some programming based on RFT just to see can we can we build a little bit more flexibility in the area of arbitrary stimuli and which we did, but then the craziest thing started to happen. Their social behavior started to look more fluid and flexible, even though we weren't really even targeting that we would have kids that had problem behaviors that without any intervention on our part would just disappear. We had a kid that would engage in high rates of elopement. And so I finally just sat down with them and said, Hey man, all that running away you used to do, and now you don't. What's up with that? And he made, he said, he goes, well, mama always said stranger danger when you see a stranger run. Well, I went back in and looked at our data and looked at our census of therapists that day. And sure enough, every day we had ep ep um, episodes of elopement. There was either a new therapist with him or a new therapist in the same room. And he would take off running. And I said, so then what happened that you just stopped? He goes, oh, I figured out mommy would never put me in a place that I'm not safe. So he derived some other rule on his own. And the only thing that we were really doing with him at the time was a lot of matching the sample with contextual stimulus control and RFT. But I started really, and I really would encourage folks, I can't, remember exactly where it is now, but Jordan Belial has a great article about model dependent realism, which is basically like, let's take this whole huge canopy that's human behavior. Now let's look at each particular behavior with which we would want to intervene. And what is the most elegant, most efficient, and most effective way to do that? And so, for example, and we can, I'm sure there are listeners that may disagree, but for example, I'm still using basically the same approach to evoke vocal mans that I did 25 years ago, because I simply have not found something that works faster or better. Uh, but then when we get into other areas, uh, that, that our methodology may change based on that operant and what is most appropriate to train that skill. So our kind of holistic approach um, is very similar to how Mark Dixon has organized the peak curriculum. We have some skills that we train directly through uh, contingency shaped behaviors, whereas others, the goal is to try and teach rule governed behavior, derived relational responding, and build some aptitude with arbitrary stimulus relations. And the most amazing things that started, I've probably been doing this now probably 10 or 12 years. And as much great data as we have, which we do have tremendous outcome data, it's produced so many other observations that I can't quite explain. Like one of the things I like to do is I do like to interview kids. And as part of that, I ask them to tell me stories. 
And I would, I remember one particular boy, um, I asked him at his intake assessment, tell me a story about a dog and a cat who are friends. And he lost it threw the table over said, why would you ask me to, to tell you such a stupid story? Dogs and cats are not friends. They're mortal en- enemies. Have you never seen an episode of Tom and Jerry? I was like, wow. And so six months into treatment, I go back in. I'm part of his reassessment team. I sit down with him. I was like, okay, tell me a story about a cat and a mouse who are friends. He goes, hmm, well, that's kind of weird, but it's the story we're telling. So here we go. And he proceeds to tell me a story that not only include the cat and mouse, but demonstrates this kind of concept of friendship. And, you know, I'll take these, these kind of qualitative things that I'll, uh, collect throughout and I'll send them to folks like Mark Dixon and, and Jordan and other folks and say, Hey, help me make sense of that. And they have much larger research agendas going on than I do. So I'm still, still trying to find out, still trying to find how is it that here we have this kid and we have kids here at Apollo where we've, we've even started using this methodology with kids without vocal speech. We're seeing the same elimination of their problem behavior without us really intervening, just simply taking them through stimulus equivalence uh, teaching and uh, contextual stimulus control programming or RFT programming. And we're seeing that, and we're hearing it from their parents. You know, parents here in Atlanta are, are in the words getting around. It's like, wow, I have this child who's more manageable, will sit and actually is not running around the house, tearing up the house, will sit with me. And they follow my directions better. And I haven't been taught how to do that. He's just doing it. And so, um, and then when we reassess every six months, one of the things we're looking at is how many new skills has the child acquired that was not targeted. I think, and at my pre, hmm? uh, it just screams for some sort of empirical evaluation of this, Jim. You know, I think the, the thing that I'm, I'm curious about a couple of different things. Uh, I, I suppose one is, uh, do you have a sense if there if there's a kind of a modal profile of 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 a learner who is, I guess, uh, who would benefit the most from this sort of thing? And, and, and just to be completely clear here, uh, it, it, if you as a listener have a an individual in your practice that fits this. I'm not saying go out and do this. This is not, you know, this is, but I'm just curious, you know, uh, um, what, what, how would you describe the individuals who are most apt to respond in this way? Uh, and of course the, you know, uh, as, as you're describing that, I'm also like, thinking through, oh, that would be just so cool to figure out how to test this uh, and, and empirically, you know, ex- exam, I was going to say validate, but I'd say empirically examine it. This, this potential. Yeah, I get asked that question quite a bit and I get, I get the, the classic, well, you can't do this with two-year-olds. They're too young. Well, research suggests that deriving starts in typically developing children at 15 months of age, but I try to, to break everything down to its simplest foundational components and then build from there in the RFT literature. Uh, the, there's there's kind of two fundamental camps or, or categories that they talk about. And one is CREL, think about relation. And that talks about the levels of arbitrary relating uh, mutual entailment, which is very similar to uh, Sidman's symmetry, combinatorial entailment, which is similar to transitivity and equivalence then transformation of stimulus function. But they also have something called C-Funk, F-U-N-C, or if, yeah, we'll think about function and the two fundamental components of that, which are vital, they call um, orientation and evaluation. Basically, to make it real simple, does the learner attend and is the learner motivated? That's every single thing we do. If we, do, if we don't have a learner who is attending to the learning materials and or we have a learner who is not motivated. Now, some children present with pretty severe deficits in their learning readiness. They're not ready to learn. 
So we have to start there. But in my mind, and in what we do with our clinical model here at Apollo, they may not have a single blatant RFT program on their intervention treatment plan at that time or individualized treatment plan at that time. But that's the pathway. That's our conceptualization is we want to get them all the way through this. If you think about, um, I don't think this is limited to a curriculum, but if you think about something like the peak curriculum, we literally want to see them go from the level of not learning ready all the way to being able to derive fairly complex stimulus relations. Now, obviously, not every learner is going to get there. Some of our clients present with um, multiple conditions. Some have severe intellectual disabilities or other disabilities, you know, traumatic brain injury, other things like that that could mitigate their outcomes. But it's been my experience more than not that if I take the learner where they are, try to get high levels of attending and flexible attending, good, solid joint attention, and I try to keep them highly motivated, then pretty soon I'm going to be able to assess, can they give us a symmetrical derived relational response? To me, that's where it starts. Dermot Barnes-Holmes calls that, which their language is mutual entailment, like the basic atom of human learning. If I teach you an A to B relation, can you give me the B to A relation without direct training? They can't do that. We got to fix that. Mm -hmm. So if you think about some of the initial targets, once we have that learner, no matter how old they are, once they're learning ready, we're going to have a number of targets. We'll probably have a number of receptive labeling targets, a number of TAC targets, for example. Well, if I arrange my receptive language targets as audiovisual conditional discriminations, then the symmetrical derived relational response is the tact. So I can, as I'm doing that, I can say, okay, we're going to launch all of these receptive uh, identification programs. So we're going to do it as audiovisual conditional discriminations and matching the sample. We're going to keep tacting in baseline. And we're going to see as they acquire the, the correct the, the, the correct discriminations in our receptive labeling programs, do we see the tact emerge? If it doesn't, I would argue we need to address that as soon as possible because that is the, you know, getting back in our history a little bit, you know, in, in the 50s, 60s, and I think maybe early 70s, behaviorism was the dominant school of thought in psychology until Noam Chomsky came around and to anyone who's not a behavior analyst laid the hammer down on Skinner. And it was really this very issue. How do you explain human learning in the absence of direct teaching or direct feedback? And, you know, this is pre Sidman, all this stuff. And, and, you know, I've been, been told uh, by mentors that Skinner just refused to debate him because he said Chomsky didn't understand our science. I just think he, honestly didn't have an answer to that. And, you know, Steve Hayes kind of picked it up from there and made it his mission to answer the Chomsky criticisms with a behavior analytic explanation. It helped that, that Murray Sidman published his work in 71 with stimulus equivalents. But I would argue that that is what sets human learning apart is our ability to derive infinite relations when, when the learning environment is presented correctly. And when a child cannot do that, which in my graduate training with stimulus equivalents, I'd never been told, hey, you might, you might um, encounter individuals who don't drive. I was just told, hey, look, this is a cool way to get a whole bunch of targets with like half the teaching or a third of the teaching, just really super efficient. It's like, oh, this is awesome. Here's some matrix learning. Here's some just stimulus equivalents teaching. Here's some great stuff. And then when I really started to look at that with children with autism, sure enough, they couldn't do it. We would have a kid nailing receptive color identification 100% session after session after session, week upon week upon week, put it up in front of them. They have vocal speech. What color is it? Nothing. You know, or they would say something, you know, that's just incorrect. And so I found that the sooner I can intervene on, on that repertoire, derived relational responding, uh, and get those symmetrical uh, derived responses to start emerging, we make learning go exponentially faster. 
because now they're also better equipped to learn from their natural environment, which you could argue is just one huge soup of multiple exemplar training. So to say what's the ideal client for this, um, I'd say all of them. I, you know, there are some, again, that will have challenges. Yeah. So let me, let me, let me, where let me, are they on the road? Let me narrow the question, I guess, uh, or ask it a, a little bit better uh, than its original formulation. Uh, of those individuals, you've seen reductions in problem behavior mm-hmm. specifically. In other words, using this type of, uh, uh, I'll just call it language intervention mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. as the main independent variable for achieving a, 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 a socially significant reduction in problem behavior. But that that's, that's, I guess, where well, I, I, what I really well, meant I by you. that question. Yeah. So those learners historically present almost like the old Asperger's diagnosis. Okay. So they have very sophisticated sounding expre- expressive vocabulary. Um, when you really start digging into their receptive language, their pragmatic language, not so much. They, they don't have the same level of skill that they have with their expressive language. So they're learning ready. They tend to be, in my experience, somewhat, you know, four years old or older. Uh, they're not going to fight you, you know, trying to get away from the table if you're doing matching the sample. Uh, and, and like I said, you're not having to work on a lot of expressive language targets because that repertoire is already there. You're really trying to teach them how to manage uh, first of all, how just to derive and then how to manage arbitrary relations. You know, I, I and it's always so funny. I had a, we have a brand new BCBA and he went through a, an assessment last week with me with exactly the type of child I just experienced. We're going through a lot of our direct targets, looking at our man repertoire, looking at our tacting repertoire, all these things. No problems. It's like, wow, this does this child even have autism? Why is she here? He actually asked me that during the break. When I got into using the peak comprehensive assessment, when we got into equivalence and transformation, a completely different child emerged. She started screaming at us that our images, because it uses arbitrary symbols, started screaming at us that we were throwing cursed images at her and that you know, she didn't want to go out of here. This made no sense. We're, we're, we must be aliens from a planet that, you know, speaks a different language. It just became like this very calm, very well-spoken child really started, you know, having a lot of difficulty as we continued to push the arbitrariness of the materials we were presenting her with. You know, it's, you know, in fairness, this, this, uh, this learner, uh, you know, some of those, some of those symbols <laughs> you know, are pretty strange looking. So I, <laughs> I get it. Uh, all right. That that's helpful. That's kind of what I had in mind, but I just want to make sure I was on the same page. Um, I, I think it's worth, uh, I think it's worthwhile talking about some, some terms here, you know, so, uh, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about is um, I've seen people use the term RFT and peak, the peak curriculum, almost interchangeably. Like, uh, and um, I, and again, I can see if you're talking about the transformation module, you know, and again, just for folks who aren't familiar with, and this is not, you know, uh, I, I guess I should start this by saying um, you're welcome, Mark Dixon, uh, but this is not necessarily a commercial for uh for, for for peak uh although we will talk about it from from we have been talking about it but uh you know there's four modules that kind of i guess ascend in their complexity i suppose um and uh some of them might be more oriented towards an rft approach but can, I, I, I where where have you seen or maybe it's just me but have you seen people get kind of uh, either confused with or or use these these terms interchangeably when they shouldn't they, you know so what, yes, what, what, they, what kind they, of what kind of guidance do you have uh, for, for for folks who want to discuss this stuff in, in a more precise manner? Um, PEAK is an assessment tool and a curriculum. They're tools. Uh, philosophically, they line up very well with what I just talked about with kind of my conceptualization of language and language intervention, starting at a level of pre-learning readiness, going all the way to complex arbitrary relating. But... It, it, it's it's an efficient tool for a clinician who wants to take that approach because a lot of the hard work, uh, and, uh, I'm sure as you did 
or, or, and learned when you were in graduate school too, when you're sitting down and first trying to come up with equivalence classes to train, that's where the that, that's where the difficulty lies in the programming side. And with Peak, that's all done for you. But you know, as you know, Mark's one of my best friends in the field. I'll just put that out there. But he didn't invent stimulus equivalence and didn't really come up with with RFT. But he did conceptualize a very efficient way to kind of weave that into your treatment model if that's something that you choose. But yes, folks, folks become very, very, uh, I think, confused at times. Um, and I get it. This is new stuff. Uh, but I also want to just kind of put out there, I know we're not necessarily talking about it. I hear ACT often thrown out, separated from RFT. And just as a quick, maybe something we talk about later because I've used ACT with a number of children with autism, but relational frame theory is the theoretical underpinning of ACT. And I've heard Stephen Hayes say himself that it's very difficult to effect effectively use ACT without a good foundation in relational frame theory. But if a practitioner wanted to go out there and Mark would probably not be happy with me saying this and design their own programs around the, the ideas of Sidman equivalence and relational frame theory, they absolutely could do that. Uh, I would argue that my clinical experience and the emerging efficacy data that we see coming out around peak makes it a very useful tool. So RFT and equivalence, those are our theoretical foundations. Peak are tools designed to use that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen clinics also clinics that I've worked with. It's like, yeah, all this direct contingency learning, we feel really good about what we're doing there already. So can we just use the E and the T books? Sure. That's what I started with when I really started evaluating peak. It's like, Hey, if I'm going to, you know, kind of overhaul what I'm doing clinically, I want to see what's making it different. And the equivalence module and the transformation module are what clearly make peak different than the other products on the market. But just to make sure I understand you correctly, there could be clinics out there who are getting great outcomes with uh, early learning operands, you know, uh, targets as it relate, you know, using a VB map. Early or start Denver Ables, model, yeah, whatever. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and then this could be something to help support learners who, uh, as, as they advance in their, in their complexity and their, et cetera. I think what is unique about uh, direct training and generalization in peak is they have age norms, published age norms. Now they are getting old. And if Mark's listening and he's heard this from me on the phone, we, what our field needs normative data mm. in, in the world of medical necessity to be able to go and really show meaningful outcomes to folks that don't understand our ideographic single case design approach, but to say, Hey, here's a typically developing eight year old on the, on this equivalence material and here's what our kid is doing and showing that slope of improvement. So we really need age norms for all four modules, but I use, I still use, they're, they're about four years old now. So we probably got it. Most IQ tests or norms are updated every five years. So we've got about one more good year to use those. The samples are, are smaller and, and could be more diverse, but it, it's really useful. And parents find a lot of value to say, hey, here's the, the initial deficit between your child and a typically developing peer. And as they've progressed through treatment, look how we've closed that gap. That speaks to parents. It speaks to insurance companies much uh, more meaningfully than say, hey, look at this graph of, of manding and here's baseline. And we did this multiple baseline that they, they don't get that. They don't, they don't quite understand it. So, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I could see that for sure. So, um, I think we. I think Jim, I I've covered a lot of the stuff that uh, I I want to ask you about. I, but I'd like to suppose uh, end with. Uh, I guess um, are are there things that you want to say about this that we haven't had a chance to talk about? Yeah, and then, I want to talk. And, and, and then I guess on top of that too, if there are. Um, uh, if there, you know, I, and I'll link some of the stuff about Peak and and other things. I've got a I've got a full page of uh, a notebook page here of, of notes that will go in the show notes. So people can just go to behavioral observations and find this stuff. But if there are other resources that people are could could check out 
uh, if there are things they want to learn more about that, you know, suggestions for that would be something else as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I kind of want to, given that we just talked about assessment, I want to say just a little bit more about that, that uh, assessment is more than just the tools that we use. So one of the questions that you had sent me was related to the VB map. Um, I'll just full disclosure. I can't remember the last time I completed a full VB map. Now, I use components when I believe that uh, it would be helpful in the assessment in front of me. I uh, had a child two weeks ago here at Apollo. We conducted an assessment on. Uh, the child did not. We, we went through and did the peak comprehensive assessment. The overall score was one, which is incredibly wow. low. Uh, we did not observe any instances of vocal speech or any approximations. So I had one of my BCBAs spend about 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes with the child completing the early ECOIC skills assessment from the VB map, just to see, do we get any approximation at all? Or are we starting literally with a child who makes, you know, no attempts at vocal speech, which is what we found. We had a zero on that. I find that that's also, so that, the ESSA will now become a part of her reassessment so that we can uh, um, just another data point in evaluating our treatment efficacy. We also used, because it's, it's sometimes it's difficult when you, when you have some problem behavior, but it's not really severe, but it could be a barrier, but you really can't justify in the limited time you have under insurance codes to do a full behavior assessment. I'll often also pull out uh, the barriers assessment from the VB map. I think it has a long history uh, showing its efficacy in use to reduce barriers to learning. And then one additional one that I really, uh, I, I'm, I really use quite often. So when we have children who show no functional communication and no vocal speech, the methods of alternative alternative speaking assessment from Essentials for Living is an excellent tool. Uh, and it lays it out for parents really well. Here, here's all the benefits of these different types. Given your situation, uh, we've used that tool to help collaborate with speech language pathologists so that we're all on the same page as to what the uh, functional communication plan is for that child. If you look, PEAK, for example, is the curriculum is not a set of methodologies. It's a set of targets with some suggestions. So to go in and say, hey, I'm going to use PEAK to build functional communication in a non-vocal child, well, you, you might as well just leave PEAK on the shelf and just come up with your own protocols for that. But I find that, but first things first, because you know now everybody wants to come in and every single parent wants their child to have a speech generating device because that's the new fad thing. But let's go in and really look to see if that's appropriate for your child. And I find that methods of alternative speaking from uh, Essentials for Living is, is an excellent tool to use. So I, I really kind of hope and I encourage BCBAs and here at Apollo, we kind of take this triage approach. It's like, hey, ABA is a huge tool shed. There's wonderful tools in there. There's a chainsaw, there's hedge clippers, there's even a little snippers. Don't always bring out the chainsaw for every problem that comes your way. Get some information, review records, do some direct observations, and then build an assessment methodology that best fits your client's needs in the moment and long-term. And so we'll use multiple components. Most of our payers here in Georgia require what they call one complete assessment. So for us, that's the peak comprehensive assessment, but we'll pull in tools, you know, just as appropriate, you know, some, some methodologies are more elaborate than others because the child may present more elaborate presenting problems than others. But I just want to encourage our listeners to really don't think of assessment as a checklist or the tools think conceptually about assessment and then choose the most appropriate tools to help give you the best picture now and long-term for your client. Yeah. You know, it, I, and I, I like that message, you know, and I think there's this temptation to say, well, I'm a, I'm a peak guy or I'm a VB map guy or, you know, and, and, and what well, you're really, what I'm hearing from you is, you know, it's kind of going back to that scientist practitioner episode. We did a few, once back is, you know, like, uh, 
base what you're doing off of you know the the needs of the learner evaluate iterate as as needed and go from there so i think that's that's exactly right and if we're going to stay true to our first episode where we kind of laid out here's the foundations theoretically of our clinical model we would be hypocrites if we didn't apply that to every single thing we do and so that's exactly that's the same approach that we use with language intervention behavior reduction staff supervision uh keeping our culture positive and, and healthy is those 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 um steps of scientific problem solving form the foundation of that and if you really adhere to that you can't be a peak guy you can't be a greg hanley iska guy or an awada guy or a vb map person you have to choose what's most appropriate based on the available data for your client and their presenting problem all right uh, well, Jim, this has been a uh, another fun conversation. So thanks for joining us in the uh, third installment of the Apollo Case Study Series. I look forward to chatting with you in the fourth one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at behavior podcast. <laughs>